what, what kind of what kind of print does that look like right here? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Why, why? There we go. Yeah, I know what it is. That sure looks like him, Adeline Robinson. Oh, well, right what is that? Could could you say that louder for the people in the back, Kagan? That sure looks like an Adeline art print. <laughs> Where are my prints, Lucas? <laughs> Son of a, you know what? I have. Okay, this week it's gonna happen. This if, you need to make him feel better about these shipping boxes, man. Give him something to look. I, I will. To. I'll, I'll send them out this week. I'm getting dude. hit at every angle here, Lucas. I'll ship them out this week, dude. It has been a long time. I'm sorry. Oh man, I actually just put some of her stickers on. My I was incubator. joking. Hey, they they won't make it before Christmas. Now I'm like, hey, now they're not gonna make it before my birthday. They'll, they'll make it there. They'll be there next week. That's a it, good Valentine's Day you present. Know, you know, you know what? Like, why I'm avoiding it is because I'm so scared that they're gonna get messed up. You, you just have to put them in a box. They're, you can, can put fragile on them. What if I just? What if I just? What French. if you? What if you just come down to Dallas Arlington and get them in person? I know that's what you're trying to make me do. That's I'll, too long. I'll do it. I found out I had a UPS close to work. <laughs> Anyways, Kagan, take us in. Yes. All right. Welcome to episode 78, everybody, of the Retic Lounge. We are so, so happy that you guys are joining us and taking some time out of your day to listen to this podcast, man. I'm always super excited to sit down and talk with these fantastic gentlemen, Lucas Bagnara and Nathan Katz, and I'm Kagan Andrew. Um, shout out to the Patreon members, of course. Um, always on the Discord, always having some of the most amazing, engaging, thoughtful conversations from locality stuff to bioactive stuff. Uh, that Discord is always going, no matter what time it is. I am often woken up by three in the morning by somebody on the Discord talking about something, and I love it. Um, <laughs> What's crazy about the Discord and our Patreon is I never thought I'd be interested in corn snakes, and here we are. I know, man. I found one the other day and I had to throw it on there because I was like, dude, guys, look at this corn snake. This is the coolest corn snake ever. Um, as always, a shout out to the TRL sponsors, Stuart Design, Heli Guy Serpents, Focus Cube Habitats, and VivTech Products. Sponsors are awesome. And make sure you guys give a like on whatever platform you are listening to, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Give a like, give a share. It helps build the, the the platform. It helps share the content. We really appreciate you guys doing that. Is that better? Is that, that good? Was great. All that right. was great. All right. <laughs> the, the enthusiasm and theatrics, mm. is, it's my favorite. And one oh, last man. thing. If you guys are not a member of US ARC, make sure to check US ARC. They are the ones fighting and protecting our rights as reptile keepers. And it is really important to jump on that bandwagon. Yeah, especially now with the whole Louisiana thing coming up. Um, yes. Yeah, for, for those of you that don't know about the Louisiana, you know, bill that's been proposed, we talked about it uh, in a previous episode, but uh, there's good information out there on it on US Arc's website. Um, and, you know, the, these, what, what I'm nervous about is they already have like, a, a, it sounds like they're just going to be amendments that are made to a bill and amendments are really hard to stop. So you know, US ARC is needing more support than ever to be able to try to fight to reverse some of the things that they want to add in there. Um, and it takes five minutes or so to do all the pre laid out stuff just to email the legislators to talk yeah. about it. So yeah, take the time. Yeah, we have a bunch of topics that we are going to talk about today and a lot of them um, I I'm excited about, but you know, Nathan and I were on the phone um, and messaging back and forth and he brought up a very good point on the importance of keepers and breeders physical health when it comes to keeping a reptile collection, even if it's just a few animals and how our physical health can directly impact the well being of our animals. So um, Nathan, for someone that struggled with, you know, well, that that's a, and, yeah, that's a big thing that comes to mind. Like the, the major health issues, whether it be like 
you know, that back surgery I went through or, you know, just even getting hit with a gnarly flu, you know, that that's going to happen to you a couple of times a year. So, you know, or what knocking do... your head. <laughs> right. It, Man, it Kag hurt, Kagan's man. not letting me live anything <laughs> down tonight. And <laughs> <Sorry>. like. <laughs> it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't a slam. I'm just. I'm Nothing just at all. If I cracked my head that hard, man, that, just that, that up was the fastest thing I was able to bounce back from. I was I was yeah. doing snake work the next day. All they oh. had to do was throw a couple stitches in me. All I had lost was my pride. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I'm for... sorry. I thought it was way more way more intense than that. <laughs> I mean, it looked bad, but it, it yeah, looked, looked rough. It looked yeah, rough. it looked rough. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, for me, like, I don't know if you guys can hear, I sound stuffy as hell. I've been on my, just, I've been feeling like shit with sinus congestion all weekend. And, um, I, yeah, I got hit with the flu last week, same thing. So it's, mm -hmm. I mean, even I, I feel like my personal experience with that, just with how bad this flu was for the first couple days, like I didn't do any snake work. Luckily I didn't have any like cages to clean until day two but i let it go for an extra day before i started feeling better to actually get everything done yeah um for me it was definitely more of like you know I, again fortunate that i have a couple people that that come by and you know they help and mm -hmm. that that's you know and so during that time i'll still be in there and and you know i'll, I'll you know if i'm feeling like shit i, I still will try to scrub the bottom enclosure and everything. But I, I think this weekend I was doing that for one of the enclosures and got, you know, uh, and this was the day that I was there by myself, but started getting just a little like lightheaded from being up and down and moving around. And, you know, I ended up not cleaning it the way that I normally would just cause I want to kind of get it done with. So, um, and, and I could imagine that the larger the collection that you have, you know, when you're out sick for, you know, you catch, COVID and you're out of commission for five days or the flu or, mm -hmm. or, you know, it, it can, I mean, just significantly impact your animals. That, I know that but, when I was, oh, oh, you go ahead. no, no, you go ahead. I know that when I was sick, um, and had the flu and was gnarly 103 degree fever, um, the things that I could not let slide was when an animal would go to the bathroom in a water bowl doesn't matter how cruddy I'm feeling. I'm still going and changing that water bowl. I can't smell that's fair. Dude, that's that fair. smells like shit. And that, that's an like easy awful. change too. And if they, th there was one girl I had that just blew up her entire cage. I mean, like the whole shit and shed combo, just whole thing was a mess. It's, it's one thing if you're feeling cruddy and you literally, when you stand up, you feel like you're about to fall down and you're like, okay, well, this snake has a, six foot enclosure and there's a little poop in one corner it'll be okay for a day or two while i recover and then finally get around to to taking care of that um because sometimes you do have to prioritize you getting well first before being able to throw yourself in a situation like that but if it's something like the whole enclosure you know that's i was like well i'm sick with 103 degree fever and i'm gonna be cleaning a snake cage <laughs> yeah right i uh I have been, or Nathan, you, you were going to say something when you and Kagan collided. Oh, I was just going to say like, well, in terms of like the, the back surgery stuff, I, I think it's nice to have people within your community, like locally that you can rely on too. So like having a few people that you trust with larger snakes, if you do have retics that can come over and help you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we, you, someone made the comment about like, you gotta, I think Kagan, it was you, you said you have to like put your health first so that you can feel better and, and, you know, get back to like good health and, you know, but, but I'm currently in a predicament right now where I'm, I'm putting my animals first before me because, um, my, you know, I, I had a major, major knee surgery from an mm -hmm. injury, uh, in high school and weird story that I'm going to keep short. I literally woke up one night like four five months ago maybe and i literally woke up from my sleep from my knee and like crazy amount of pain and it somehow just like got like out of place yeah. um and since that's happened you know if i sit down 
weird or if I get into bed the wrong way or even if I take a wrong step, my knee will like shift and get out of place. And so I know another surgery is needed, but I, I'm putting it off and managing because I, I don't know what that's going to look like. If I'm, you know, if I'm a month post-surgery and can't bend my knee, can't do anything, like what the hell am I going to? No yeah. wrestling well, with that would be different. anymore. It wasn't yeah. even that. <laughs> no, I know, but like if that was happening in between, no. Yeah. Well, that I mean that that a would clearly Adler, be Adler hands off my man's. <laughs> I I just mean if it was like a one or two day thing where you were like, okay, I you know, I I if, if you only have one reptile or like five, oh for that's sure. different. No, but if no, you've got I... a, a big collection where you're gonna spend multiple hours in there mm -hmm. cleaning, where you're around the cleaning supplies, you're around the, you know, all the dust that comes with cleaning enclosures, that yeah. can that can hurt your health too. So if it's one or two days, then that's one thing. But being out yeah. of commission for like a month, that would a month is probably bare rough. minimum. But I, fortunately, you know, after that happened, I started getting back in the gym and and my knee has gotten a lot stronger so um because before I, I could literally cough and my knee would freaking start hurting and and now it, it takes it takes something you know so like i just i just can't sit indian style and so sometimes i'll get down on the floor to sit down with my daughter and i'll you know cross my leg and i just hear oh. little and i'm like oh fuck. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well and that's kind of really what i was bringing up in this topic was staying on top of your physical health, like going to the gym and, you know, training a little mm -hmm. bit. If you're working with larger animals, I think that's something that isn't talked about enough. That's super important in us keeping these animals healthy as, as well. Whether you're just getting into retics or you've been breeding for years, the first place you want to visit is Stuart Design. More and more breeders keep showing up at shows on Morph Market and are all over social media. Sometimes it may feel possible to get anyone's attention. Stewart Designs helps small businesses like yours do big things through brand clarity, helping entrepreneurs to start and scale businesses that are easy to know and love. Their work can help any company or industry, but they've done a ton of work for ours. Stewart Design created the brands for US Arc, Canova, Reach Out Reptiles, Coiled, and dozens of other well known reptile breeders. Like many of us, the owner of Stewart Design, Blake is a keeper and breeder who fell in love with Retix through first working with Garrett Hartle. Although Stuart Design does a lot of corporate work, Blake has a passion for working with people in the reptile industry. Stuart Design can help if you're just getting started or you're ready to take things to the next level, you're struggling to stand out and build your presence online or at shows, you don't want to be like the other guys or get lost in the crowd, and you want to make your own way doing what you love. And also, you have big ideas and know your business is special, but you need help sharing it with the reptile community. If something here resonates with you, reach out to Blake and have a conversation. To learn more or get started, visit stuartdesignbrands.com or call them at 855-SD-LOGOS. Clear brands own markets. Stuart Design helps create them. If you are in the market for an enclosure for your reticulated python or any other one of your reptiles, Focus Cubed Habitats is your one-stop shop for not only the best looking cages on the market, but also provide amazing features and add-ons to your cages. We partnered with Focus Cubed Habitats because they continue to innovate and change the way we house our animals unlike any other caging company out there. Their cages are designed intelligently and provide the most stylish and secure housing for your animal's comfort and well-being. Visit focuscubedhabitats.com for your animal's caging needs. Again, visit focuscubedhabitats.com for some amazing and stylish enclosures. We also want to thank VivTech Products for being an affiliate sponsor of the Retic Lounge. Stop by VivTech Products for the best UV spectrum lighting on the market that will enhance and improve your snake's overall well-being and health. Visit VivTechProducts.com and use the code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Again, visit VivTechProducts.com and use our affiliate code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Looking for the perfect accessories for your hatchlings or juvenile retics? Look no further than Heli Guy Serpents. Our sponsor, Chris Sexton, 
is coming in hot with an amazing 3D printer, creating top-notch perches and other caging accessories for your beloved pets. Enrich your Retix environment with their high-quality products. Use our promo code TRL10 for a 10% discount on your purchase. Visit them today at heliguyserpents.com and start giving your pets the best. Heli Guy Serpents, the premier source for 3D printed caging accessories. Again, that's www.heliguyserpents.com and use our promo code TRL10 for 10% off all of your 3D printed accessories today. Yeah. I've definitely noticed a huge uptick just in keeping myself healthy because I have asthma. I'm prone to, you know, respiratory stuff. I get bronchitis at least once a year, but I've noticed a huge uptick and in my health. Rodents. And I have to wear a huge respirator every single time Smart. I go to clean them like today. Smart. Um, have to. I have no choice. Otherwise, five minutes in, I'm, I'm wheezing. Like but dead. when you take care of your body, you're consistently taking care of your body. You can just take care of your animals better. But Another facet of this is not just physical health, but your mental health too. For sure. So that comes with depression, anxiety, anything like that. Um, going to the gym is a huge, huge help with that too. Yeah. Cause I know people that I've talked to personally that, you know, they've gone through their bouts of depression and, and their animals definitely, you know, they, they are very suffer. much aware and yeah, their animals suffer. So, um, you know, I think that it's important to just your physical health and mental health are definitely connected. And, um, you know, if you take care of one, the other typically improves, um, mm -hmm. in some facet. So just, uh, especially with large constrictors, like Nathan was saying, um, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't think Nathan was saying it or implying that, you know, you got to go to the gym and bench 225 no. times and right. Like, I, I don't think anybody no, knows, but, to be swole, but general maintenance and making sure that you're, you're staying healthy. I mean, even right. recovering from sickness, I feel like, you know, once you're able to at the tail end of a sickness, going back to the gym helps me bounce back from that kind of stuff a little bit faster. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I agree. I think it's an important thing that we need to continue to just do for the betterment of the animals as well. Uh, well, and you're, I mean, you're just, you're, you're investing into yourself. I mean, you're investing into these animals. So, I mean, I'd much rather get injured, like doing something fun. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then cleaning some then, shit. Yeah. Then, then, then just my body giving out on me. So, right. like, like I'm able to enjoy my life a little bit more, including the life I have with these animals. By the yeah. time I put into the gym, and the time I invest in myself. Yeah, like I still want to keep retakes when I'm 50 and 60. I want to yeah. be able to get a. I still want to be able to mm -hmm. get like a, play, like a play with your kid as she grows up. The, all, all the just right. you know normal stuff, but. Right. You know, as we get old, it gets harder. Well, dude, and I, I, I probably went about a year and a half, two years without going into the gym. And, and, you know, I, that my knee was like a wake up call and I was, you know, yeah. my job, my job, my is back to, was mine. So I, I get yeah, it. Yeah. My, my job is to sit down for eight, 10 hours a day and listening to people. And, and so I'm, I'm already inactive. And then because that's exhausting, I want to go home and just sit on the couch and relax. And, and that's more inactivity. And, um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's a body in motion stays in motion, a body in rest stays at rest. So it's important to just keep the body moving. I can only imagine how taxing, I mean, I'm sure it's rewarding in so many areas as well, but it's gotta be taxing to, you know, sit there, and take in all of this information all day, all while sitting, and then try and motivate yourself to go be physically active after that really draining, emotionally draining day. Oh, yeah. I mean, I like, you know, ever since I've been doing this, uh, you know, I, I, I always compare my like mental capacity for, you know, to converse with people and not just like, as a therapist, but like in my personal life and then also the mm -hmm. energy, like it's like a battery. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, at the end of a work day, you know, being a therapist, you know, the best that my battery is at is like 40, 50%. And then I got to go home and, you know, I have a family, I got a daughter, I have my own snakes to clean. I have, you know, I have my wife and, uh, I can't just be absent from their lives, uh, or my snakes lives. So, 
yeah, it, it's it, it can, and that that's what I'm saying. Like you know, getting back into the gym and taking care of myself has has my my battery has now like increased. I have like an extra little lithium ion attached to, you know, my meter, um, <laughs> and it yeah. I mean, it's 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 true, and I mean, you know, we're over here talking about health, right? And we're like, what the fuck? We're talking about retics, but no, I mean, I, I just I, I genuinely think that you'll you'll just enjoy your retics more and be able to to keep them better and you know especially if you have a larger collection, if you're just taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So as we're, as we're talking about like size of collection, stuff like that, um, let, let's talk about, you know, Kagan brought up a good topic that I think, you know, we, we definitely can talk about for a good while, but what, what's the appropriate group size for snake breeding? Like how many snakes is, you know, a, a, the, the sweet spot or a good number to, to have? This is always just something that I've kind of wondered about. Um, so what got me thinking about this was the fact that last year in a ball python project, I had bought a one, one pair of a, uh, for a double recessive project. And um, the female ended up laying 12 eggs and all the eggs went bad about a week into incubation. And that was it for the whole year. You know, I, I had spent, two to three years raising these animals up, getting ready, getting really excited for it. And I had one shot, one shot at it. They ended up failing. It's okay. We're coming back around on it. I'm getting a second shot. I'm really stoked for it. But it just got me thinking, um, especially with uh, the differences in size of like ball pythons. You know, it's easier to have a larger group of those if you wanted to versus reticulated pythons. It got me thinking, what is the appropriate group size to have for recessive projects, for localities, you know, for, for anything really that you're wanting to pursue. Yeah. And I think, I, uh, Lucas, you had mentioned that you were wanting to downsize, uh, some of your locality stuff, specifically the turnate group that you've got. Yeah. And I mean, not so much like, you know, I, I'm still going to very much pursue and, and work with tur It's one of my favorite localities. Um, but, you know, right now in my garage, I have one male uh, and three females. And, you know, I've talked about on this podcast how I'm in the process of just downsizing some of the retics to just make things, you know, more manageable and also to, to free up some room for uh, other projects that I'm working on. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I have three females and granted they're they're unrelated to each other and unrelated to the male so like that's good diversity but do i really need three ternate females um mm -hmm. and i came to the decision that no i don't like i i you know two i think is good you know two i have an opportunity to you know produce you know if one female decides not to go i got another one that's you know on deck or that I'm also trying and that gives me that safety buffer. And, and then I think that like, if my male ended up being a ship breeder, right? Like, let's say he just happens to be infertile. That's always something that you can like go back and just purchase another male. Right. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's, it's a lot about like the number of females you keep is important. And I would say that like, if you are wanting to work with a project that like, you're really like really into and want to make strides and advance it, I would definitely say like two females is, mm -hmm. you know, a good, but, but it, it all depends on, it's going to be different for everyone. It's going to depend what their motivation is as a breeder. Like, are you doing this for like fun and the enjoyment and like, you're not out there to try to produce a, you know, a, a combo that hasn't been produced before. And, you know, do do you care if people beat you to the project? Like everyone is different in those areas. And, and if, and if you're someone that just like wants to make a pretty snake, you know, and you have 1.1 to make that pretty snake. And if it doesn't happen that year and it's not the end of the world to you, then by all means, I think stick with 1.1 because yep. the, the, mm -hmm. trust me, the least amount, like the, the lower number of retakes that you have, the, the better it is for you and the animals. Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's so I think, um, for like recessive projects, I think one, two, is the sweet spot for me at least with that's ultimately what got me to want to um get that ocelot from you is not only now do i have 
three lines, well, potentially three lines of compatible albinism between the three of them. But if one girl doesn't go one year, I still have the shot with the other. And it's a project that I'm really passionate about. I don't feel like I'm ever going to fall away from that. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't have a, a huge number of projects, you know, I don't have 12, you know, recessive projects that I'm wanting to pursue. I have only a handful. So. Yeah. yeah I'm a, uh, in terms of like the adult animals that I have, and even with the stuff that I'm trying to move and kind of like reposition my collection towards, I feel like I still end up at that 2.4 spot. So. Yeah, one point. Are those two. all? How? Those are all interchangeable. Well, like it's all—it's all, it's all kind of like the snow project. Uh, yeah, snow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mixed with some phantom, mixed with some tiger. Yeah. But you've got you've got different stuff going on in there. I mean, you've got you could focus on specifically anery. You can focus on oh, yeah. you know throwing the phantom plat, into one, but not the other stuff. If I want down the line, golden child stuff. If I want down the line, mm -hmm. yeah, sunfire stuff. If I want, like I, I have a lot of avenues that I could take it uh, mm -hmm. with the animals that I want to keep. But you, you know, and to be honest, like if, if you're going to keep your collection small at like 2.4, you know, a lot of the animals that you have, like we've joked and talked about because they're like genetically stacked that they like, they just, they don't look amazing because they just have a bunch of genes in there. But to be honest, if you're going to keep your collection small, it's actually, I, I think it's a really good idea to have a couple animals be genetically stacked re regardless of how like visually for, they, for they me and appear. what I want to make, it works mm -hmm. perfect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think it's a good idea to have some of those powerhouse animals that, that, you know, with one pairing, you can produce three, four different combos. Yeah, and I mean, repeat one of my favorite clutches I've ever made. So, yeah, I'm excited for that this year. I hope you not not too bad, and then add snow on top of it. It's yeah, yeah, that's all I can hope for. Yeah, the 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 hard part as a locality person, right? Like I'm going to be removing my morphs, right? Besides my ocelot, um, and I'm going to be getting rid of any of my other morph animals that aren't pure localities. Besides and... the tiger. Yeah, no, that's a pet. She's not even in the conversation. Don't you um, dare, Lucas. I, I'm no. working on if actually. She, if she goes anywhere, she comes straight back to Utah. No, when when she <laughs> when she when she grows out that bioactive rack, um, I'm probably going to be putting her inside the house. Uh, oh, that's awesome. And, and I know this won't happen, but same goes to you, Alessa. You just bought the poopal albino. <laughs> if that ever goes anywhere but your house, it's back to Utah. No, that's got to stay in the TRL fam. That's Big time. Poo poo for life. It does. Um, <laughs> the hard part about like the locality stuff is after I, I eliminate all the morphs that I have, just locality stuff, I still have 20 plus retics. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even have 1.2 of like, I only have 1.1 Halmas. Um, I only have 1.1 fills. Uh, and and at so, this point, it's just the retics that we're talking about. Yeah, just the retics, man. And so, so and there's more saying, species like, on the way. Like, right. I, I just want to add one more species. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just one more and one more. And, and yeah, so year 2024 is, is the year for uh, eclecticism. Uh, Diversification. Exactly. So... <laughs> Uh, I, I just I want to go back to like how I was as a kid. I had a bunch of different species of snakes, but yeah, the locality stuff is hard. Um, I'm almost playing with the idea of like just getting a, you know, when, when I produce a clutch or two of a locality, you know, I can move the project to someone who wants it, and then I can bring in a new locality and produce a clutch or two of them, and then move it on to. So I, I've, I I'm almost you know I don't even know what my future holds with locality, but it's hard to keep 1.2 with you know, eight localities in my garage. It's, that's a lot of animals. So let me ask yeah. you this, Lucas, um, out of your three turnate females, how did you decide which one you were interested in rehoming? Was it something about the color, the pattern that really yeah. stood out more about the other two rather than the third? How'd you make that decision? Yeah. So one of the turnate females is a younger, she's almost two, and it actually belongs to my helper, Sean. He got his first retake, a turnate female, but he keeps it in 
you know, my garage, um, you know, his, he has other reptiles at his house, but his mom was like, you know, if you're going to get a retake, let's keep it there for now. So, um, but aside from that, I can always work with him and, you know, use that female with one of my males and we can work together and just, you know, do partnerships together. We, you know, live 10 minutes away from each other. Um, so the, yeah, the one that I did choose, she is absolutely like phenomenal. What I love about her is that she has a very different, unique pattern than from any other tournament I've seen. She has like, she has like the donut look in her neck and then she stripes out mid body and then towards her tail, she starts to look like a normal tournament. Uh, cool. And the reason why I chose, and she's at like a green phase, like she's very silver and has those green hues. But the reason why I chose her, even though I think she's probably the most unique tourney out there, uh, is because what I am obsessed with about tournates are those jagged patterns and the the, mm-hmm. the busy, chaotic patterns that tournates have. Mm-hmm. And so with my desire to downsize, if I want to produce, you know, jagged, like silver side flames and you know i want to produce a good turnate look she's Mm -hmm. just not the right female for it because she looks just so different than what what i love about turnates so that that's why i chose her she's she's a phenomenal animal but um you know and i've had her since she was you know one and she's turning i think five this year um but yeah, like a sentimental animal. So, you know, I am not in a rush to get rid of her whatsoever. So you like producing, am I understanding it right? That you like producing more uh, look wise. What is the more kind of classic look for that locality rather than just like something totally out of the box? No, no. So, I mean, no. I, I also would or love to make things that are out. Of, I'd love, I would love to make things that are out of the box. It's, it's just what I love personally about okay, turnate yeah. specifically are okay, the yeah. are the very like triangular shapes that they have and this female gotcha. is very striped out so it just doesn't gotcha that makes yeah. sense um because yeah no i got a halmahera male that has like this crazy almost like sula like pattern which is very abnormal and i can't wait to take him to the female well you were talking mm-hmm. about chafing the striped rosettes on the Soleil stuff right yeah trying to do that and so yeah so it's just yeah with the locality thing 1.2 is just not feasible if you want to have a lot of localities and and to be honest it is so hard to even think about like if i were to get rid of a locality in my garage like i haven't even crossed that point yet i'm i'm impressed that you've had such phenomenal success just by having for the most part like one one pairs of stuff because I'd be so, you know, if there was something that I was really passionate about, I'd be so sad if the male was just like either too young or inexperienced or couldn't go, but you've had really good luck. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, people, you know, they're like, man, you're killing. I'm like, I'm really lucky. Like I, like that's just how it's been. And this year I had a lot of like, you know, not lucky things happen. Like I had my ocelot. Artho was, King. Yeah. My, my Artho ocelot. King. My ocelot was set to breed to, to two or three different locality females. He didn't get the job. Like my Kaiwati went off of food fully. I put him in there. No interest. Uh, pure Superdorf that's here. Uh, Het Anry went off of food. Like I only saw him arch a couple times. Never saw lock. Uh, my mm-hmm. uh, a proven breeder turnate that I had. She went off of food. I put him in. No arching. No interest. Like he struck out three times this year for me. Um, what, what's funny, what's funny is I think that, that pure Superdorf and the Turnate, I think they're both, they, they've been off of food and they're looking huge. And so they, yeah. they, maybe he did lock with them and I never saw it. And I'm really hoping mm-hmm. that's the case because I swear if these two partho out, I fucking quit. <laughs> I quit. My snow mail, my snow mail is quick like that. Like I'll be cleaning like earlier this year I was, or late last year, I was pairing him with a female and I put him in the enclosure. I would watch him go over lock. And then like 10 minutes later, I turn my back, look back around and he'd be on the other side of the enclosure. About 10 minutes later, he'd be wandering back over there. Some males are just. So the, the reason, the reason why, <laughs> the, the reason why I don't think he got the job done 
was because uh, he became a proven breeder at 12 months old. <laughs> she had to mute herself. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Sorry, she Lucas. Is, no, that's okay. Um, he was a proven breeder at 12 months old, and that dude was arching. That dude was locking for hours. That dude, like, he was slithering around with one of his hemipenes taken out and, like, just in and out, in and out. And I was like, okay, like, this guy at 12 months old knows what he's doing. So that's why this year when I saw his behavior the way I did, I was like, did something's wrong. Jeez. How are those eggs doing, Lucas? Which one? I was gonna ask. How are those turnate eggs doing, Lucas? <laughs> oh, um, one's alive. Just one? Yeah, yeah. It's a partho clutch. What do you expect? I know. I was just really hopeful. No, I mean, I've had success with some partho. I mean, I've, yeah, I've, I've hatched quite a few parthos, but no, this one was a, a group of I don't know how many eggs that were stuck in the incubator. Maybe eleven. Uh, and yeah, we're we're down to one, but the one looks good. How far away are they from hatching? Is it from hatching? Uh, a they've month only or been two? the they have only been in the incubator for five six weeks, so we're about you know a little less than halfway. Okay. Yeah, it's really sad to see this like one lone egg in this like twenty eight quart incubator box. <laughs> Man, well, speaking of incubating eggs, you uh, earlier with the Slayer Clutch were trying something very interesting, and that was to see if uh, there was the possibility that reticulated pythons had the opportunity for um, sex-determinating incubation with temperatures. So there's a lot of reptile species out there, particularly geckos, to where you can higher, heighten, or lower the temperature and the majority of the clutch will either come out male or female. And nobody really knows if that's a thing with reticulated pythons, but what did you find with this clutch? Yeah, I got the idea from talking to Paul Lucas. Um, and uh, me and him have talked a lot over the last like six months. And he told me, he's like, hey, go, go for lower temps, see if you can hit more females. And I had always heard that, you know, that was a possibility or a thing. And, um, you know, when you look at the results that I had and I incubated like at 86.5, right? So, um, you know, back, you know, 10 years ago, most breeders were incubating at like 89, right? And so mm -hmm. 86.5 is pretty low. I will mm -hmm. say, I definitely think they could be hatched lower. Uh, so mm -hmm. that might be something that I try in the future. But for now, I think I want to do like a handful of clutches at 86.5 because you know, the odds, like, so there's 24 eggs that hatched and there were 15 females and nine males. And like, I feel like on the surface, you look at those numbers and you're like, oh, that's female heavy. But like, if we do the math, if let's say it's a, it's a split clutch 12 and 12, um, I, I only had three additional females than I did males from the 50, 50 split. So I, I don't know if that qualifies as like significant or not mm -hmm. um, in order to like, you know, it's still a theory that I'm going to now do that for like two or three other clutches and see if I consistently get more females. And then what I might do in a couple seasons is I might bump up the incubation temps to 88.5 and then see if it like that that's how you would have to do that like somewhat mm -hmm. scientifically to, to really be able to determine outcome of sex ratio so this is like a it's going to be a five-year ordeal you uh, gotta start somewhere though and that's really cool that you're trying for it yeah i mean i'm just i don't know i'm curious you know <laughs> i feel like you know a lot of people might be trying to shoot for more males or more female heavy cycles and if we have some solid I guess, and it, like, it's anecdotal, but I guess it's like organized anecdotal. Like it's 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 you know there's a method to it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think it'd be interesting to to just experiment. I mean, I was hovering around that eighty six and a half to eighty seven and a half range with my last clutch, and out of the seventeen, I think it was five point twelve. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I wish I had more consistent temperatures to be able to, you know, add to your data, but yeah. And yeah. And that's the thing is like, uh, you know, with your incubation this last year, I know there were fluctuations because of the igloo cooler ordeal. Um, it was really only within a degree, degree and a half, but yeah, enough where I, I didn't love it. Yeah. I mean, I consider that a big swing, uh, at least for, like my incubator top to bottom, the swing is, is at most like 0. 0.7 degrees. Um, and I know that if you have like a one and a half degree swing with like chondro eggs, they'll die. Still waiting to find a perfect fridge. Cause I'm not in, uh, wow. I'm not incubating in that igloo any, anymore. Yeah. I'm not igluing guys. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> igluing in that incubator anymore. <laughs> So yeah, to, to, to be continued, it's data I'm going to collect and data I'll continue to share and just let people know. And I, you know, this isn't like a secret. I think that I'll make, you know, what, once I have two or like one or two more other clutches at the lower temperatures, um, and I'll start like just releasing some of the, you know, results and, and kind of the, you know, I'll explain kind of what I just explained to everybody here. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's fun. You get to play scientists in more ways than just making morphs and stuff. You get to like experiment with with other things like that. Bring in the lab to lab exotics. Right. That was kind of there the idea is. behind it. A lot of people think it was like <laughs> just my initials. I was like, no, I'm like I'm playing scientist. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Same thing. Like same dumb data that probably no one cares about. But like every locality clutch that I produce, I'm weighing eggs. I want to know the average weight of a, a, each locality clutch. So speaking of dumb data that maybe not everyone cares about, but what do you think of the retic market right now, Lucas? And maybe going into this new year, we have an election cycle ahead of us. How do you think that's all going to influence everything? So I wanted to bring up, that was a great transition. I was that. just about to say, that man, was, that, that was, was beautiful. Smooth, and smooth. I, I wanted to, I wanted to like, <laughs> one, that was beautiful. <laughs> Two, I want to let everyone know that I wanted to bring up this topic because we've talked about the market in the last TikTok and other episodes, but I have a new take on the market. I'm sorry. That why, You're laughing. That's fine. Makes me feel like I'm funny and I know I'm not, so it's okay. Um, so... Yeah, I so we have talked and everyone in the retail industry is talking about how dead the market is and how, you know, the economic recession, people aren't buying animals and, uh, you know, people are, are just not spending a lot of money on, on retics. And the one thing that I've learned since the Slayers hatched uh, is that that's not true. Um, you know, 24 eggs and I have like 2.4 available and it's only been three weeks since they hatched. And so, and then on top of that today I posted, you know, a, that, a that's tar- also a supply and demand thing. I mean, well, we, we haven't had us captive born slayers in a while. Well, so that that's kind of what mm-hmm. I'm going to like caveat into. Um, I then posted a, a tribal Philippine on my, my story saying ready to ship um Mm -hmm. again another example of supply and demand and you know i threw that up on my story and the first time in a while that i put that on there and someone snagged it within an hour and that's an expensive animal it's over two thousand dollars um and so i started thinking that certainly this recession and you know everybody's finances are a lot tighter and that's going to influence decisions that are made uh and I think that I think that if you produce animals that are, you know, next level to whatever anybody else is producing, or they are animals that don't come by like once in a while, people find the money to to spend on these animals. They'll they'll do what they need to do. And so it's made me think that the market is there are still plenty of people out there with money to spend on retakes. But I think that even those people with money are holding back because a lot of people are just producing a lot of the same thing. And I think people with this economy might be worried about the investments that they make. 
Yeah, it's it's more of an educated market for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, I have Tiger Head Ocelots and you know, but but a couple other people have produced them and a bunch of people over the last three years have produced head ocelot clutches. And there's a lot of them that are out there. And so I think a lot of people that normally would be motivated uh to to buy into that project with heads that like during a good economy are now like you know, I have the money for it, but the, you know, I, I, but there is some financial strain and there's been a lot of them. And I think people are just making smarter choices to not spend money on projects that people typically would, you know, if the economy was, was better and, and their wallets weren't so tight. Yeah. I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But I mean, if I'm looking into the Ocelot project from my, my perspective now, I mean, I would have bought a het female two years ago and then raised her up until this point, bought a visual male and called it a day. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Especially in today's market, you know, you probably could find someone to sell a visual male for much cheaper than it was two years ago. Um, oh yeah. So yeah, I just, it, it was, it's been an interesting perspective that, you know, because I was, you know, I, I was selling the Kaiwadis this year and I've, I've had the tiger head ocelots and I've had, you know, some of the, the Kalatoas that I've had and, and a lot of stuff has moved slower, but then I, 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 I realized that, um, if you're producing a lot of what people are producing during a bad market, it's going to be very difficult to sell those, those animals. But if you, you find a, if you find a niche, um, then I think that you can solidify yourself to be kind of, you know, market crash proof, so to say. Um, and not proof, like it still might not be like, you're not going to fly off the wall, but um, supply and demand is a big thing that Nathan said. And I think it applies, but uh, especially so in like a bad economy. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Keegan, you're quiet. I mean, you summed it up excellently. Uh, excellently. So, I, I think you're right, and and you definitely have chosen very specific product uh, pairings and localities that not a lot of people have access to. So, just like the Solaires, those haven't been produced captive bred in a pretty long time, and people are going to jump on that when they see it. But you know, like the other day, I saw on. Uh, one of the retic groups and i always appreciate when people go in and make a post asking like hey if i did this pairing would anybody have any interest in it and this pairing just so happened to be something like a male purple motley to a female sunfire head purple you know and it and it a lot of people in the comments were like honestly no the market doesn't need more of that but i i think it's really excellent that people are taking the initiative to first say hey would there even be any generated interest in this Testing if I were to do this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it's a project that you're you're pursuing that you you know might not sell super fast, it's something that you have to realize that you might be raising up animals for a little bit longer of a time. You might be investing into that project a little heavier than you thought. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I also want to talk about like market manipulation and like like you know the the whole. You know, and I've, I've even been guilty of talking about this on the podcast before when it comes to, uh, you know, I, I've said this before. I said, you know, if you produce a clutch of expensive animals and no one buys them, you know, it's your responsibility to raise them and to keep them and not and not crash the market value um, of those animals. And, you know, I don't fully disagree with that statement. But one thing that I will say is that I think that we do a lot of like gatekeeping when it comes to like certain markets. Like the, the fact that we are holding everybody to a standard to keep an animal at a specific price when everybody who's breeding these animals have a different set of, of uh, you know, overhead, a different set of costs, a different set of, of you know, it, it's, it's, I hear a lot of people say like, oh, during the recession, you just have to like keep the price at where they're at and hold on to them. And that was like how I felt kind of originally strongly. Like if you're going to breed them, you know, don't, don't lower the cost of it because you know that no one's buying but at the end of the day like you know they're they're 
who's to say that we can't drop prices during an economic recession and that those prices won't go up when when the economy is doing better and when people have more money like i i i think a lot of people do a lot of gatekeeping to try to like you know protect their self mm -hmm. versus like everybody is just really out to like each individual is out there to do what's best for them and if doing what's best for them means selling an animal at a lower price to move inventory quicker um then I, I don't know why a lot of people are, are like ostracized or like like they, they're looked at negatively for doing that yeah i mean we oh, all just sure. i mean the people that are in for it just the animals we want to be able to breed next year and if that means you know moving stuff out so we have room for next year's production that i i kind of agree with you lucas not everyone needs to be a commercial breeder not everyone can have you know three ars 10 racks with 65 slots in each of them not everybody can can you know everybody has aspirations to like you know breed cool things that they want to breed and, and if you don't move those animals out and, and you don't have any more space you can't do what you want to do that year and why, why am i going to judge someone for for moving animals out you know cheap during a bad economy uh you know and, and what i mean by cheap is I'm, I'm not talking about like go ahead and sell your super doors for a 100 bucks like i'll punch you in the face don't do that um but wait you know, I, I can't i can't be just like doing doing give outs of retics right i mean you can <laughs> but you're going to be in a lot of business debt <laughs> um but yeah i don't know i think that that oftentimes we look at people very negatively when we uh when we see people that have lower prices than what the market is during bad times like this uh and at the end of the day i don't think it's worth talking shit about those people because you know, some of those people have a family to feed. Some of those people have animals to feed. And, you know, you you have to sell the animals. And, and just because they produce them and they're selling them cheaper does not make them an irresponsible breeder, in my opinion. I, I, I know of many, many irresponsible, ugly breeders that, that will get top dollar for their animals. Um Especially if you've had something in your rack for over a year that you're feeding on a weekly or biweekly basis. Dude, it's so that expensive. That is as expensive over the course of a year. People don't realize longer. that. You know, I, I'm spending like every time that I buy food now on Cold Blooded Cafe, Road and Pro, wherever the hell I'm getting my feeders, right? Not mm -hmm. not for my larger retakes, but I'm getting like mice and rat or whatever. Um, you know, each time my shopping cart's seven, eight hundred dollars. And 75% of that is going to my hatchling rack. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> because you know what happens when you have hatchlings and, and you, you know, you have 50 hatchlings that's, that's to feed all of them once is a $45 pack of food. And then mm -hmm. what happens when some of them don't eat? What happens when some of them bite constrict and then drop, right? So you're not even getting a full feeding for all of your hatchlings with a $50 pack of rats. So yeah, feeding and raising these animals, like you want to talk about like, oh, I'm going to hold on to these to maintain the market value. But but you are, by the time you sell it for market value in a year and a half, you can subtract probably like three, 400 bucks per animal because you've been feeding it. Mm -hmm. So you're better off just dropping the price three, 400 bucks at the time and selling it right away instead of being stubborn. Mm -hmm. I know that there's somebody out there that's thinking like, oh, $3 for a rat for one snake for a year. That's not too bad. But then you got to step back and look at the big picture of, you know, having with one clutches. clutch for me, it can be 20 snakes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's one clutch. And then Lucas over here, you know, he's shooting for <laughs> for the stars with those retics and <laughs> You yeah, know. I, I had my, I had my, I have an ARS hatching rack here and I had it full besides two slots. So I had, you know, 63 babies at one point. I remember picking through and yeah, I, my, my mind was just like, okay, that's $4, $5, $3. Yep. Dude, it's, <laughs> that's it, it, every it, week. Dude, yeah. And, and so, you know, again, you want to be a retic reader and, and you think you're going to, you know, get rich, reconsider. So here's something else with willing to take a lower price on a specific animal morph market has recently dropped an auctions feature where you can put up an animal for auction. 
What do you guys think about the new auction feature? I mean, there's reserve prices, so as long as you're happy with the reserve, I think it's no no different than running a, a, a sale on any of your animals for, you know, the bare minimum of what you would take for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there is some like safe keep, like there's some safety net there. You're able to set a reserve and, you know, for example, if like the lowest you'll take for an animal is 1200 you set that re- reserve at 1200 and if people don't hit that bid, then then no one gets the animal and... And that's that. Um, I, I love the idea. It, it, it's engaging and interactive. What what I don't love about the idea, and I don't know how Darian didn't think about this, um, is that there are many states in which you need an auction license to do an auction. And if you are doing an auction on Morph Market without an auction license in Texas that that's an illegal that's an illegal sale that now can become a Lacey Act violation because the animal was purchased and acquired illegally and moved across state lines so now you're committing a Lacey Act violation <laughs> you know i hadn't thought about that i wonder uh and i wonder if we should cut this out of the episode because i don't want to piss anybody off but like <laughs> I, like i i am so concerned that people don't know their their state laws um and don't even know, but I guarantee you there's probably been at least a dozen people that have committed Lacey Act violations. You don't think that there's some kind of protection on it being, I don't know, on a on a platform hosted, like if it's hosted by Morph Market, it, it or does it I, not matter? It's still I, your state. I don't because you are conducting business in your state. You okay. you you are paying business taxes. You're paying sales taxes. You're paying everything in your state, and so. I don't see how that, you know, maybe there is, maybe, maybe, maybe Darian looked into this and it's legit and you can do it on a, just a neutral online platform. Um, or I don't know, maybe wherever morph market is based out of, maybe it's legal there and that makes it legal for all of us. But I think that, uh, I, I think that, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's something that is, everybody needs to check their state laws. Right. Like I, I put one up for auction and then I remembered someone told me a while back that we couldn't. I looked up my state laws. I can't do auctions. So mm-hmm. I am not going to commit a Lacey Act violation and do that. But yeah, that's something I wasn't aware of. So yeah. one thing I, I really haven't looked into the retic auctions. The one like I think I looked like within the first couple of days and there was only one or two of them. Um, one thing that I really, really love uh, about people inquiring about an animal is that I'm able to perform a little bit of a background check, so to speak, say, okay, you know, what kind of experience do you have with these animals? What are your enclosures like? Do you have any prior experience with large constrictors? And just kind of get the feel of what that person knows in terms of this specific animal that requires specific care. And one thing that's kind of mm-hmm, a little unsettling, I guess, about a large constrictor auction is you don't know who this animal is going to. Uh, I feel like I, I like I listened to it definitely a little bit of uh, Darian talking about the auctions. Isn't there like a period where you can accept or deny the the sale? There, there, there definitely could be. I, I feel like that would that I want to say yes. Um, but I, I, I know he's be. done his best to try to safeguard it in as many ways as possible. Yeah, yeah. but I also, that's all I, I know for sure. I also know that Morph Market has made statements that if you don't follow through on your end as a buyer or the seller, that you'll you'll be you'll, you'll have a ban or you'll have a ban you or won't be able to you ain't, won't be able to do auctions. I think. Yeah. Is. But I don't know. I feel like if someone, like I feel like as a business owner, and I I denied the the you know, the winner of the auction, my animal for ethical reasons, I could mm-hmm. at least put up an argument and, and not get banned. So you got to vet buyers. And if you're not vetting buyers with retics, like you're, I mean, with with any animal really. Um, but, but yeah, if you're not vetting your buyers, then uh, you, that's just poor business practice. That's bad for the animal. 
one thing that I noticed, um, I haven't gone through a ton of auctions, so I don't know how many are actually like this, but uh, first day of kind of going through the ball python morph, first couple days, um, I clicked on an animal. I was like, oh, that's a, you know, a pretty morph. I noticed that the price was, the, the, the leading bid was at $600 and it said reserve price not yet met. And I was like, that's kind of odd. I don't feel like this animal should be going for that much. So I went ahead and looked up, you know, the, the kind of median price for what these animals go for. And the median price was 600 to 650 for this specific morph combination. And the ones that I saw that were lower price listed for sale were of higher, you know, visually higher quality, better pigmentation, more intense color than the one that was currently on auction. Um, so it just makes me wonder what it's going to be like for people that are only putting the reserve price, you know, $50 lower than what the asking price would be and how that's going to kind of clog up the system. I, I think that'll definitely limit people's sales. Mm-hmm um yeah to limit their success on an auction and right now unless you're like a top tier morph market person you can only do once a month so make yeah. it, make, make I, it count. <laughs> I think darian at one point um it was either right before this launched or right as it launched he had kind of said like we're kind of getting a feel still for allowing people to set the reserve and you know he had mentioned like if too many people are doing kind of like what I had said, then they might just nix the reserve price altogether. And he said, but we're, you know, we're still feeling it out. We're still kind of getting an idea of, of, you know, it's so brand new. We just kind of have to test the waters. Yeah. I, I like cool. that. Yeah. I like that he's experimenting and doing new things and, and, you know, trying to get people to engage on morph market and, uh, you know, one, one thing that I really appreciate about Darian is he understands, you know, the, struggle that a lot of people are having selling snakes and he's trying to do what he can to you know make that uh doing whatever he can to try to make that easier for sellers yeah so yeah i mean good on my good 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 in my books and and again i love the auction idea i i i, I love that it's now available on their platform i just want to you know caution everyone to to know your state laws yeah worst case scenario good Go get an auction license. I'm sure they're not that expensive. Mm -hmm. All right. Time to drop a new topic, I guess. So barometric pressure and snake breeding. So the other day I had been talking on one of the Discord channels about how I use sensor push modules in my incubator, in my snake room, and how I have the modules uh, that specifically have barometric pressure in them. And I originally had gotten these uh, just to be able to tell the most to a T exactly what temperature my incubator is, but it was a pleasant surprise that the ones I had could actually sense barometric pressure. Now, if you are in any snake groups at all on Facebook, you may have seen at some point when a storm rolls through, you'll see that, posts that, that was say, the first Pyramid, post of it, or piece of advice that I got from any any person Pyramid, trying to. You got yep. It, it, <laughs> no, I mean in Utah, one of my buddies who was helping me through my first breeding, he's like, "When it starts snowing, go." Mm -hmm. So, I have my module set to alert me whenever the barometric pressure drops below a certain point, and that way I know, okay, something's rolling through, I can go ahead and pair my animals. Now, I can't tell you exactly what it is about barometric pressure dropping that makes snakes more likely to want to breed, but I encourage you, if you ever have a storm rolling through, Go through your snake room and look at your enclosure and see your snakes because I guarantee you some of them are going to be cruising and being really, really active in times that they might normally not be. Yeah, I, I think that like people, you know, the, the main way that most breeders breed retics, and maybe that's an overgeneralization, but at least from a lot of the people that I talk to when learning how to breed, a lot of people always go to the the like feeding route of mm -hmm. uh breeding right like just pound them heavy and you know until they go off of food you know when they're sexually mature and then you know pair male or you know you can you know uh what's it called palpate for follicles as you're feeding heavy but 
one thing that I am learning just as the years go on and as I continue to breed, it's so much easier to utilize your 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 city like where your locations weather uh if you just if you know about retics and when they breed in the wild you know that they do it during the rainy season um Mm -hmm. you know when it's storming you also know that during that time of the year there's typically an influx of food because that's when other animals are typically you know breeding and and there's there's an abundant of, of food so feeding is part of it uh you have to think about a female definitely you know makes sense that they would want an increased amount of calories because they're going to go several months without eating mm-hmm. uh, uh if you use... isn't it brian barcheck that said calories in production out yeah yeah um so i i think that in in you know conjunction with some of the storms has always been my mentality behind it yeah exactly um and and, and you know you can definitely breed retics year round using the feeding method, but more times mm-hmm. than not, what you're going to get out of the feeding method alone doing year round breeding is, is obese retics, you know, because mm-hmm. you'll, you'll have a point in time where you're trying to get a female to have her first clutch and you're cycling her with food and she's pounding food for four or five months. And now your snake has grown by one third and it's, it's <laughs> huge and it still hasn't dropped a clutch for you. And it's, it's not good for the, the animal's health. So, yeah, barometric pressure is huge. And and if you don't have a sensor push system that tells you what the barometric pressure is, like on a normal day and, and what it is when it's storming, like just wait for the first Vip-tech. thunderstorm. Right. Yeah. Just just wait for the first storm and and you know, start observing then. And when when it's storming and getting cooler in your area, then start to increase the calories. Like like use your weather for your your benefit so that your snakes are healthier long term. Yeah. So here's a fun engagement thing. You guys should comment below if you're listening and you have a thought on how barometric pressure can affect your animals. If you utilize that, if you know exactly why, you know, whether or not it's the influx of food during rainy season or for some other reason, if you guys have any insight on that, I would absolutely love to hear it. So drop a comment below in the comment section. She's bringing in your thoughts. <laughs> I really do genuinely want to know, though. Like, well, I would love to hear from people about it. To, to round us out, do you want to introduce the the last new thing that you really wanted to throw yeah, in? We're, we're gonna do. We're we're. Do, I'm, I'm I'm vetoing this. We're doing this at the beginning of the next TikTok. Okay, I agree. I think that'd be fun, just like wow. an introduction. So, but well, we'll, do, we'll no. I'm Lu- saying, Lucas no, I'm thinks we'll there's a it. time to be positive. No, we'll we'll do it. We're still going to do it now, but I'm saying moving forward, we're doing it at the beginning. We, we kind of talked about that. And like 15, 20 minutes ago, I was like, oh, yeah, we didn't do that. Exactly. <laughs> so, so an idea that I had for something that we could start doing on every TikTok second segment is highlighting a person in the in the retic community, in the reptile community in general, that is bringing in positivity that is doing something just really cool standing out in some way or another just something that that we can show gratitude for i would love to bring you know just another av- avenue of positivity that we can bring into this into this podcast and i would love to hear you know just one person per episode that you guys or that we can all agree on that somebody is just really awesome yeah. Okay. Oh, so, so drop those names in the comments as well if you guys have okay. any recommendations. But Nathan, I'm gonna like yeah. do a little drum roll here, and I'll let you pick our first person. Well, yeah, I guess I I, I have the pleasure of starting this one out. I I, I thought of no one better, uh, especially after the last few weeks of uh, just Christy Lynn uh, of Rocks and Reptiles. Uh, here, let's 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 share her Instagram. Why not? Oh, I love that. So uh, one thing that I'll say about Christy that I I absolutely um, love about what she does is um, not not only does she rehabilitate. This this picture says it all. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know Christy, she she likes to take in animals that uh, are, are found or like kind of adoption animals and she, you know, gets them back to health and she keeps them and she loves on them. And not only is that something that's just amazing and just kind hearted to do as a person, but 
In addition to that, mm -hmm. what I notice that she does on her reptile page all the time is she is constantly, constantly sharing other keepers and breeders content. She mm -hmm. is constantly supporting other people on a daily basis. She's going through and sharing posts. I, I, I think I've probably followed 50 people just from her stories. I'll mm -hmm. see a story, I'll see an animal that I like, and I'll go to that person's page and I'll like, oh, this page is awesome, and I'll follow them. And and I don't, I don't even think she's doing it intentionally, but I don't think she realizes how much of an impact that she's having for for small keepers and breeders and, and getting their name out there. Yeah, everything that she touches is incredible. I mean, her art. Yep. It's great. Uh, she's super vulnerable on, on her pages about, you know, struggles she's going through and you know, the struggles of working with animals full time. She also uh, is working over at Marine Land and working with like the belugas, the orcas over there. Yeah, training and, and doing shows. Yeah. So, I mean, she's working in the winter time, rain or shine, mm -hmm. snow or shine to make sure that these animals are healthy. So, uh, Christy, thank you for just being someone who loves these animals and Beyond that, you've been a huge, huge supporter of TRL over the the little bit of time that Lucas and I have been running this. So yeah. just thank you for everything you've done. Yeah, she's been a great friend over the last couple of years. For those that have never uh, rescued and rehabilitated any kind of reptile before, it takes a really big heart to take in some of these animals because it can be really, really painful to see the state that some of them can get into. It not, not only can take a emotional toll, it can take a big financial toll. So being willing to put yourself out there and do this kind of work is, is really, really incredible. Yeah, I agree. You rock Chrissy. Woo. Oh, isn't the word rock it. in her, her name too? Yeah. Rocks and yeah. reptiles. Yeah. If rocks anyone didn't reptiles. catch that just in uh, the screen sharing there for all of our audio listeners, it's rocks and reptiles. So R O C S N R E P T I L E S yeah, on let's, Instagram. Let's, let, let's pick the chosen one for each of these episodes. Like when we pick them, let's, let's put their, uh, like let's announce them as winners in the description and put their, their social link. It's R O C K S N. Did I, did I misspell that? He said R O C S. She's, she's, oh, no. she's on it tonight. I got you. I got you. I'm here for it. Especially Let for our audience. Nothing slide. Kagan Andrew. <laughs> Gotta love it. All right. That's a that's a wrap for another TikTok <laughs> and episode 78. Again, guys, engage, uh, engage, you know, give us your thoughts on this new segment that we're doing in this episode and, and drop any comments that you guys have. Don't forget to hit that like button and the you know, if you guys are just discovering us for the first time, subscribe and hit the notification bell. We release a new episode every Friday. And yeah, we're, we're excited for, you know, we've, we've had an uptick in subscribers. So welcome. Glad, glad you guys are, are tuning into the content, but you guys got anything before we go? No. Only thing I've got is that, you know, I've got a lot of gratitude for the people that take the time out of their day to just listen to us talk about snakes. I think that's really cool. And I appreciate all y'all. Damn right. Yeah. Couldn't be better said. <laughs> all right, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs>